And uh, I also was probably one of the last whistleblowers to get on a cover of a magazine. I mean, and actually survive. Um, there are some others that have been in covers of magazines, but they're either holed up in embassies or, or uh, unfortunately having to seek asylum in foreign countries. In the last 12, 13 years, there has been a sea change that has gone on. When they say 9-11 changed everything, that part of it is true. It absolutely is. It shouldn't have changed everything, but it did. Uh, most of the failures of 9-11 actually turn out to be failures, and this is not me saying this, this is the 9-11 com Commission, it is actually the, the Joint Intelligence Committees. They found that it was the failure to share information. Not only inside agencies, as the case I wrote about Musawi was, a, a blocking, stovepipe blocking, but also between agencies. The CIA knew that those two hijackers had come into California, and they didn't tell the FBI until a couple of days before 9-11. Okay, so the FBI is like, why, why didn't we know this? We could have stopped 9-11. There were many ways that 9-11 could have been prevented. Uh, the last failure to share information of 9-11 was failure to share information with the public. Because actually it turns out most of our recent terrorist attacks are actually stopped by fellow passengers, by um, you know, street vendors in New York City. It does require people to be vigilant, but if they don't know what's going on, if the government keeps all of this uh, information secret, so on top of a persecution of whistleblowers that has gone on, I, I tried to explain before the, the, the um, uh, session started that the difference between being a good whistleblower and going through channels is that they have, they've grabbed the 1917 Espionage Act that is way overbroad, it's unconstitutional, because it actually stops the press, too. It actually says the publication of information, or even the reading of information. The last two sections of this 1917 Espionage Act were never, ever um, enforced, because they're, it's pretty well known that they're unconstitutional. They were never enforced after Ellsberg. Very rarely were they ever even attempted to be used, even in truly cases. Now they're using it to keep the truth from coming out. And they are not only threatening life in prison, but that, that uh, law entails execution, so it's not far-fetched to be threatening execution. These things really ne need to be fixed. And I wrote yesterday uh, an article, and it was, it was inspired by a cartoon you can, you can check it out on a, a few websites. I'm a Huffington Post blogger. I'm, I'm one of you in a very slight way. But I wrote this article called NSA uh, dot, 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 no problemo until. And I think we are at that until moment. The, the cartoon is funny because it starts off with the NSA putting its antennas up and spying, and Congress says, go ahead. And then the second frame is more antennas are up spying on, on, in different directions, and the Congress says, okie dokie. And then the third frame is lots of antennas spying all over, and Congress says, no problemo. The fourth frame is one of those antennas has come, swung around now to be spying on Congress. And when you're at that moment, Congress says, hold it right there. I think that's what we saw two weeks ago when Dianne Feinstein gave a very dramatic speech about the constitutional balance of powers that the framers in their wisdom, on, uh, as well as the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of press, uh, and Fourth Amendment rights against unreasonable seizure, they created a balance that one branch should have oversight over because power corrupts. And they realized, after King George, after the experience, that they wanted to have this balance built in, that they wanted to have independent oversight so that this would not get out of control. And if you have agencies now, after 9-11, the new FBI director, a uh, poor guy, he was only 9-11 director for one week before it occurs, and then, of course, this all it, it changes everything, and he's immediately thrust in the midst of some of these orders that occurred right after 9-11 for warrantless monitoring, orders that would allow torture, uh, violation of Geneva Conventions, all this whole series of things. He, was, he gave a speech, Director uh, Mueller, to the ACLU 
about a year or so after, uh, maybe two years, many people were afraid that, that because of what had happened, there would be this great overreaction and that we would go right back to COINTELPRO of the 60s where they spied on Martin Luther King, et cetera. So he gave a speech and he assured everyone in the ACLU audience that this would not happen. He would prevent it and stop it from happening. And, I, and of course, I won't say that he you know, was lying like Hayden or whatever. He, of course, this was early on, and he probably didn't know how this would all progress himself. And then when he's caught up in it, it just starts building, and it reaches a point just as we saw at the end of Vietnam. I think we're at this moment now. We're at this until moment. The last six years of Vietnam, the FBI's COINTELPRO was going, spying on planting uh, uh, microphones in Martin Luther King's uh, apartments and uh, hotel rooms. Um, they, the NSA had a program, Minaret, and the CIA had a program, Chaos. For you people that are older out there, that comes from Get Smart, the old uh, Chaos group. We don't actually know very much about the CIA's secret chaos, nor the NSA's Minaret program. The reason that more is known about the FBI's COINTELPRO is because a group of activists got the documents. You always need documents to prove these things. They got the documents from uh, Media Pennsylvania that show this was going on. And then, luckily, there was a person in the FBI, uh, William Sullivan, who told the truth about J. Edgar Hoover thinking that he had the authority not only to spy on and listen to people, lots and lots of Americans and, and, and civil rights leaders and feminists, et cetera, but he, was, he, he believed he had the right to disrupt on top of listening in. Um, William Sullivan said, we sat around a table plotting these things, and no one ever asked, is it ethical, is it legal? Uh, and of course, they didn't ask, is it working? That's the other thing, you know, is this even productive? Um, that's how it got out of control and went on for the last six years. Well, the part of the Minaret program that just came out in September, and this is where it's very much on all fours with Dianne Feinstein's finding out that the CIA was so hell-bent to keep the, their 6,300-page, $40 million report that has thoroughly studied this issue of how the CIA got into waterboarding and torture after the, the tapes were destroyed. And it's still being stopped. It's still being thwarted. She's trying hard to get it out, but it's, it's still there. When she found out the CIA was spying on her and then gave this dramatic spying or removing documents from their computers, et cetera, um, that is exactly where Frank Church was. It turns out that in September, one document came out about who the seven Americans were on this list of targeted. 1,650 Americans were targeted by Minaret. We don't know most of them. Seven of the Americans, though, were Martin Luther King, Whitney Young, who were civil rights leaders, not too surprising, uh, Muhammad Ali, no surprise because he was, uh, you know, not going to fight in Vietnam, um, an uh, editor from the New York Times, a uh, columnist, Art Buckwald, I think he was the columnist for the Washington Post. I'm not, I'm not, everybody's like, why, how did Art Buckwald get on the list being targeted? I guess he wrote something that was too funny. Uh, and then the, the, the last two, folks, this is where we're at. The last two we know of that were spied on were Frank Church and Howard Baker. Okay, we, there could have been more senators spied on and targeted by the NSA. Now, this is serious moment where, where we've reached this, again, things have gone to a point and a lot of, a lot of whistleblowers have tried to get out the information uh, to the press that would make a difference. And we're at a moment now where it seems like people are waking up, including Dianne Feinstein, hopefully, has kind of figured out that it's not just on everybody else. It actually could stop me. You probably can't see my, my little uh, flag here. And uh, some people think it's like a traitor flag because it says, think, it's patriotic. Um, if you consider, when I, I talk on ethics, if you consider that there's the ethical, the legal, and the, you know, what works, what's effective, what makes sense, what's smart, okay, those three things all go into every ethical decision. The 
a, the, the decision to turn on, collect it all, okay, there were people, oh my gosh, we're going to do this? Collect on Americans? That's always been in my head that that was wrong. That violates the, the executive order. The executive order says you can collect on foreigners but not on Americans. Okay, so it's unethical, it's illegal. Okay, the last part of this is that, what, what uh, Ray brought up, which is that there hasn't been for the, the billions and maybe close to a trillion dollars that have been spent on this massive dragnet. The bulk collection that Obama is going to maybe rein in, that he talked about yesterday to rein in, uh, to make it more targeted, very good first tiny baby step. I would say it's just a baby step forward. It's a good one to rein that in, the telephony metadata, but Edward Snowden's documents show that there's at least a couple hundred more that have already been revealed by, by journalists. And some of those didn't get as much play, but they're, they're actually of more concern. And so at the end of my article, I am, uh, think that it, it would be ideal, let's, let's hope the, the spirit of Frank Church is in the room here who can understand this, it would be ideal for a new church committee type investigation to occur. And Edward Snowden should be the first witness. He should be the first one to be called back to, to tell what he knows, as well as other, uh, other uh, CIA, NSA, and people should be given the freedom to tell the truth now, instead of being stopped, threatened that if they're an insider threat, uh, you know, in government they call it an insider threat, if, you're, if you raise your hand with a suggestion. You know, if, if, you're, if you're under this kind of suspicion, and you're Frederick Whitehurst at the uh, lab, and you realize that the FBI lab is not accredited, and you become a little complainer about this, they're gonna, they're, uh, gonna report you now to the insider threat program. And so we, this has gone way too far. For good government, uh, we need to tell the truth about all of this, we need a full airing in the church committee, and then, it, then the executive and Obama, uh, Congress all need to work together bipartisan, in a bipartisan way and fix this and get back on the right path.